Hello, it's Scott Manley here. By now, you've probably heard that Bob and Doug, the Dadstronauts, have come home safely. And, you know, it was a busy weekend, but thanks to a terrible miscalculation on my part, or rather being a good family man, I had agreed to go to the beach on Sunday and actually missed bits of it. But, yeah, coming back... The undock happened at uh, during orbital night, just before sunrise, and it's nice you can see the red and the green navigation lights, showing that they are indeed in compliance with the Admiralty Order from the 19th century. Uh, apparently good ideas like to stick around, even into spaceships. So I think it's actually worth talking about how they departed the station, because, you know, it's not like Kerbal Space Program where you simply undock, turn around, and then light up your engines. No. The space station is considered to be a you know, very fragile piece of hardware. At least they treat it that way. There's very careful keep out spheres and there are rules about firing your rocket engines in ways which might, say, hit the solar panels and cause too much uh, stress on them. So during departure, they try to let the natural orbital mechanics pull the spacecraft apart. And when they fire the rocket engines, they try to avoid pointing them at the station. Uh, but also, when they make a maneuver, they have to be sure that anything they do will not bring it back into contact with the space station. And you might think that's very easy. If you throw something away on Earth, it generally doesn't come back. But in orbit, you can throw something away and it will swing around in one orbit later, it'll hit you again. So every maneuver has to be you know, checked to make sure that at no point at the start of the maneuver or the end or in the middle does the orbit impinge on the space station in the next few orbits. Now, because Dragon 2 was docked onto the forward international docking adapter, when it was pushed backwards by the spring mechanism, it, uh, of course, went forwards in the orbit, and that meant that it was now going slightly faster than the International Space Station. So because of that, it went forwards, but over time, orbital mechanics kicked in, and it began to rise up because it was going faster and it got pushed out into a slightly higher orbit. And because it's going upwards in a gravity field, it's exchanging kinetic energy for potential energy, so its velocity gets lower. And that means that after a while, it starts to come back towards the space station, but at a higher altitude. So the natural way to depart the space station from the forward docking adapter is to actually reverse out and fly up over the top of the space station. And then as they slow down, they come back around underneath the space station. And once they're underneath, they convert their orbit into what's called a co-elliptic orbit. That is an orbit where the perigee and the apogee are a fixed amount below that of the International Space Station. So it's like one ellipse just inside another. And then they are in the clear. Because they're in the lower orbit, they will move forwards along the orbit until they get enough distance that they can start firing the engines more aggressively. We got this nice uh, video of the space station as well. This is actually upside down. The Earth is above us. We, you know, of course, space up, down, it's all relative. But this is an infrared because, of course, it was nighttime when they shot this. But they actually cut back to inside the capsule. And if you look at the screens in front of Bob and Doug, one of them there actually in the middle shows the curve, the trajectory that they are going to follow as they depart the space station. Obviously, the space station is, in this form, is moving to the left. There was also another amusing in-cockpit moment where uh, Bob basically showed us that the passcode for his iPad was 0530, which uh, probably matches the launch date of May 30th. And, you know, I sort of had a bit of a laugh to myself when I heard them on the way back and they were having trouble with their iPads because they weren't connected to the spacecraft network, you know. <laughs> like, literally, I heard ground support saying, have you got your iPad in airplane mode? Anyway, the magic of orbital mechanics carried the capsule ahead of the space station and a few people on the ground were able to snap pictures showing the positions of Dragon and the International Space Station, which was pretty cool. I went out, I couldn't see it on either of my views, but maybe it was just too faint or maybe uh, the cha orbit had changed too much by the time it had got here. Uh, about 18 hours later, they were preparing for, uh, for the landing and... You know, in between, they have to perform a phasing burn, and all that does is it changes the period of the orbit so that they would uh, arrive 
over the landing area at the correct time so that when they perform their deorbit burn they end up as close to their splashdown site off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Now the actual deorbit burn itself is supposed to slow the space capsule down so that it falls back to Earth. But it's actually pr uh, performed by having the capsule point nose forwards and then it uses its nose thrusters to decelerate. Uh, the deceleration is very slow. It's about 0.1 meters per second. So, you know, 10 centimeter, very light amount of gravity. It's not as if they're getting pulled out of their harnesses by the G-forces, but it's just a very slight uh, acceleration. The deceleration takes about 11 minutes. The reason they use the thrusters in the nose is because those ones are perfectly aligned forward, right? So there's something called cosine losses where you, if you have thrusters that are angled off of the direction they're supposed to be generating thrust, then you lose thrust according to the cosine of that angle. So those four thrusters under the cap are pointed exactly forward, so therefore they're most uh, efficient. The thrusters that would push them forwards are mounted to the sides, and because they have to shoot around the heat shield, they are angled outwards, therefore they are less efficient. Regardless, that's why they have to fire it in that direction and then they close the nose cone. Some people ask what happens if they can't close the nose cone. I believe that they just have a way to jettison the nose cone. There is actually a button inside the capsule which allows them to presumably commit to this after releasing all the safeties. Uh, so yeah, deorbit and re-entry happened over Mexico, over the Gulf of Mexico. And then we got the drogue shoots coming out uh, during descent to slow them down to about 150 miles per hour. Then the drogues pull away, the four main shoots come out, and they take a moment to inflate because, of course, you want to minimize the deceleration. I believe the peak deceleration during re-entry is about 6 Gs during this uh, parachute deployment. When they, were during, uh, when they were going through re-entry, of course, they lost contact with ground because the, th the plasma around the capsule blocks radio transmissions pretty effectively. When they did come back after a comm check, they said they were doing fine, experiencing 3.5 Gs. So that's, this is twice as violent as the forces you decelerate when you are literally in a ball of fire. Although, come to think of it, the actual splashdown itself is probably quite a significant force. Uh, and yeah, so recovery forces were on scene very quickly. And then a whole bunch of tourist boats turned up as well. Uh, there were like a dozen boats out there at one time. And for those wondering, there was actually an official notice to mariners that was in effect. It set out a, has a zone and it basically said hazardous recovery operations would be underway in the region and please stay away. But that didn't stop a whole bunch of tourists wanting to turn up and get their selfies with a capsule returning from space. And this is really not a good idea. The thrusters on the Dragon are fueled by nitrogen tetroxide and monomethyl hydrazine. And since they carry the propellant for the Super Draco thrusters for abort, they still have a fair amount of that on board after uh, re-entry. So m these propellants are hypergolics. They are basically liquid explosive toxic carcinogens. They are some of the worst things to be near. If you ever see orange smoke near a rocket, run away from it. Don't try and get photos next to it. So yeah, it turns out that while they were bringing the spacecraft on board, they did a sniff check using a sensor to look for these things and they were concerned because they found some traces of it. They spent a fair amount of time trying to trace the problem. They purged all the cavities with nitrogen to try to make sure there was nothing toxic that would greet the astronauts. And then the astronauts finally came on board and the crew were carried out on stretchers, which is totally to be expected after being in space for six months. Then they jumped on a helicopter, went to Houston, had a press conference. And I'm going to say, I got a little teary-eyed right at the end. And, you know, I totally understand that when one of the presenters, you know, got a little emotional too during the event. It has been an incredible honor and joy to share this mission with the public and the teams from SpaceX and NASA have worked so hard to get here and return this capability to fly humans from America. 
Such emotion is uncharacteristic of NASA streams, but I'm I'm down there with her. It's nice to see comments from everybody from all sides, and you know, for this big project that started ten years ago, trying to fix problems with a system which was never going to work, and ten years on, the U.S. now has a much cheaper and better way of sending astronauts to the space station and other destinations. So now let's switch to the other stuff that happened over the weekend. Uh, over up in Alaska, Astra was going to make a test launch of their rocket. So it was a vertical on the pad, but they had problems with weather violations. They pushed the T minus zero back 60 minutes. And then as they were getting ready, they had a range violation. They had a wayward boat cruising into their uh, splashdown space. Therefore, they, uh, they couldn't launch and they couldn't clear the boat in time. At this point, you know, I'm seriously considering writing a children's book about Scrubs the Wayward Boat, who uh, just likes to get very close to rocket launches because he's really inquisitive, but unfortunately kills what he loves. It's a metaphor for something. And we also had an update from Rocket Lab. Less than a month ago, they had a launch failure for PIX or it didn't happen. There weren't PIX, it didn't happen. The uh, second stage engine shut down a few minutes into flight and this payload ended up falling into the sea. So according to their high level summary, what happened was there was a power connector which was not a, a clean connection. It looked fine on the ground but once the rocket started vibrating it became intermittent. And intermittent connections meant high resistance, the high resistance meant high heat. And there was enough heat that it melted the potting compound, you know, the resin, the plastic that holds the connectors in place during flight. And so that melted and the connector came undone. The motor lost power, therefore there was no uh, power to pump the propellant and the engine shut down. And so they've confirmed that they will be returning to flight this month. The specific payload and customer hasn't yet been detailed, but uh, that's, that's great. We have such a fast turnaround. Also, and this morning Virgin Orbit announced the results of their investigation into their, lo their first launch failure. The vehicle worked for a few seconds just fine and then the engine failed. The reason was that the high pressure oxygen line ruptured and was no longer delivering uh, any oxidizer to the combustion chamber. So there's a low pressure system that feeds into the gas generator and the turbo pumps and then those that create the high pressure system that feeds into the combustion chamber. So yeah, um, they were probably spraying high pressure RP1 into the combustion chamber. There was probably liquid oxygen going around it, but it wasn't producing any thrust. And that probably meant that the drag actually ended up starving the engines. I don't know. I really want to read some more details on what exactly happened, but we are looking forward to a, another test launch later this year. And so with that, I'm going to say I hope everyone that has a rocket in this video has a great next launch. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Shh.